Hi, hello everyone. Welcome, James. Welcome, Santi. Good to have you for our last session of today, session three. Welcome. Good to be here. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. So um, today we're going to talk about pricing and revenue expansion strategies for agencies yeah. serving SMBs. So this is a great topic to close today. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Punar Insal. I'm your host for today, currently working for Amazon Ads. Prior to that, I was having my own uh, SEO and SEM agency. And before that, I was working for Google. So I'm also in this business for more than 20 years now. So I totally can relate with all these topics. And I'm very, very excited with the content that you two will share now. So maybe round of introductions and then we dive dive in. Who would like to start? Sounds good. Absolutely. James, you can go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go first. Hi, everybody. James Wilton. Uh, I'm the managing partner and founder of, of Monovate, which is a pricing strategy consulting firm focused on working with, with smaller companies, boutiques, uh, and growing, growing tech, tech firms. My background is I've been in consulting for about 20 years. I kind of stumbled across pricing strategy about midway into it, found that I loved it. And that's really what I've, I've done ever since in a few different roles. Uh, I was at McKinsey for a couple of years. Uh, before deciding to launch my own consulting firm, just specifically set up to, to serve smaller companies. I'm very uh, excited to talk to you all today about pricing. And I'm Santi Clark. I am our Director of Content and Communications here at Duda. Um, my background is in website and digital strategy. I've worked on both the client and the agency side. Um, and my, one of my roles here at Duda is to talk to agencies and understand the challenges that they're facing, especially as Itai mentioned in the first session with the market changing very rapidly. Um, and obviously one of the topics that we hear come up a lot is really understanding how to um, you know, price your, your services effectively and strategically for long-term sustainable growth. Um, so my role is to you know, understand those challenges and bring content to you to help you drive your agency forward like this at DudaCon. Fantastic. Cool. So yeah, before we maybe start, I wanted to ask uh, maybe people in the chat can type from where they're dialing in. So we see how international um, our crowd is today. That would be lovely. But please start sharing your screen and um, take us through. Good. All right. All right, let's get started. So we have a lot on the agenda today, and I'll just give you a quick preview before we hand everything to, over to James. Um, so first, we'll be running through building a case. So why should you shift from one-time sales to a sustainable subscription model? Um, and how do you, you know, price your services for uh, to drive that recurring revenue? Um, second, we're going to be talking about pricing and packaging for growth. So how can you leverage uh, tiered pricing, service bundling, and scalable pricing models uh, to align with the value that you're delivering to your customers um, and drive growth for your agency. And then finally, we're gonna ask the big question, how do you set the right price? Um, understand how to you know, find the right price for the value that you're providing. And we're also gonna be sharing some data on what other data agencies are charging for their website services. So we've got a lot on the menu today. Can go to the next slide. So the first uh, uh, step up here is uh, building the case for strategic pricing. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, as you know, you know, pricing conversations can be awkward, but uh, it's a very important and perhaps one of the most important things that you can do for your business is to really um, build that sustainable pricing model. It's not just about covering costs and staying competitive. It's about pulling a strategic lever uh, that can significantly impact your growth and productivity uh, and profitability. Um, pricing can also help shape your client behavior, drive recurring revenue and create long term val value for your business. The next slide. Another uh, important topic we're going to be covering today is really the opportunity of shifting towards more of a subscription model. So we're, we've all had subscriptions. You know, we all have our Spotify subscriptions, Amazon Prime, um, things like that. We're very familiar with you know paying on a recurring basis for continued value that we see, um, and we see that agencies that em embrace a subscription-based model and build recurring revenue streams are able to compound that value over time. They experience a lot more financial stability and they are able to invest uh, more in their other growth initiatives as well. Now, next slide, we'll go through just a couple, just a recap of a couple different pricing models that agencies can use to build their websites for their clients. Um, you might have tried and done like a fixed subscription model or a fixed uh, model and this is 
really when you're charging that initial fee for the website build, um, you know, maybe you're charging it up front or at the end or do a couple different payments, but this is where you're, you know, you're charging a fixed amount for a, a website build. Um, the ongoing structure is the one I'm referring to with subscription fees. That's that ongoing fee structure where you're, you know, paying a typically monthly fee um, to build and manage the site. And then kind of a mix of both where you might be building, um, you know, charging a fixed build fee and then a subscription afterwards bundled along with other services uh, like SBO or social media or something else. And then now what other agencies are charging? So at Dudo, we ran a survey of some of our agency customers. It was at the end of 2022, so a little over a year now. Um, we asked them what they were charging for initial site builds versus ongoing site maintenance. Um, so as you can see here on the initial site build side, uh, the majority of the agencies that we surveyed, 30% charge around $1,000 to $2,500 for that initial site build, and an additional 22% uh, charged between $2,500 and $5,000 for the initial site build. Now, obviously, pricing is very, very personal and very unique to your business and to your customers, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but this is uh, going to give us some helpful numbers for a calculation that, that James is going to share in a second here. Um, now, if you go over to the ongoing uh, subscription side, you can see that due to agencies are on average charging around $21 to $50 for the, that ongoing hosting and site management and another 20% are charging around $50 to $100. Um, so again, that this gives us a couple numbers to work with and I'll hand it over to James to, to show just the value that you can get from you know switching to a subscription-based pricing model. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. I mean, it's really helpful to have some actual numbers that we can talk about within this to make it to make it real. And these um these subscription transformations, people moving over to to, to subscription, I would say you saw that across industries uh, very, very frequently, probably about 10 years ago, right? There was a period where absolutely everybody was moving over from these, uh, this kind of more of a traditional sort of almost like a software model, right? You have an initial fee and then you move to a to, to maintenance model up afterwards. And the reason was, aside from all the sort of the benefits of it being easier to sell and, and, and the nice, you know, predictable revenues, just the value that you get from a from a sub subscription as a vendor is usually going to be way better than you can get from more one of these more traditional upfront plus maintenance models and we can actually see that sandy said from these numbers right so if we take what we learned from the uh the survey that we had here good sort of proxy for the you know the about the middle point of what the of what the site fees are is about two thousand dollars flat fee for for a site and then on maintenance we were sort of in that twenty to fifty dollar range, so I picked out what did you know, assume a midpoint of about forty dollars a month, which translates to about four hundred and eighty dollars per, per per year. So you have this maintenance fee that's about twenty four percent of what that initial site fee is. So now what we should do when we think about subscription is think about what does that mean in terms of customer lifetime value, which is really how you have to think about this when you think about these these transitions. Uh, I won't go into the details of, of the calculation now. That's probably a more in-depth conversation for another day. But if you have a site plus maintenance model, as if you assume that the churn rate of your customers within that segment is generally about 10%, which is somewhat, somewhat typical on an annual basis, that means your customer lifetime value in that site plus maintenance model is about $6,800 within that. However, when you move to... Sub subscription. There is obviously a bit of wiggle room in terms of how much you charge for the for the uh, the actual subscription fee that you have. But from my experience doing this in lots of different companies, usually you end up at somewhere between about forty percent to sixty percent of what the sort of the flat fee would be up up front. So if you take those numbers and you translate them to that license to that uh, lifetime value cal cal calculation, assuming the churn stays the same at ten at ten percent. You've now jumped up to a lifetime value of at a minimum eight thousand dollars, and potentially going up as high as twelve thousand dollars. So, I mean, that's a significant jump, even at the low end of, of, of the scale here. And yes, you know, it's not it's not completely seamless. It is nice to have that that two thousand dollars up 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 front and have that um, have that guaranteed. And you do have to move away from that for going to uh, to uh, a subscription model. But if you think about it over the over the long term. You do far better in a subscription model than you generally will do in a uh, in an upfront plus plus maintenance fee model. 
So hopefully clear as to why you would do that. I think you know, no a number of uh, of agencies are moving that way anyway. So hopefully that's not a, a thing that needs a lot more convincing to do. But given that you've decided to move over to a a subscription model, there's still a question of why should I care about pricing it? Why is this something that I should be spending my time thinking about? Uh, and the answer to that really is that pricing is going to be much more important and impactful than you probably think that it is. So a little bit of data to look at here. If you look at the left-hand side here, this is like an average of what a typical S&P global 1200 company looks like in terms of costs, in terms of cogs, and in terms of profit here. So you can just assume that there's about a, you know, about 15, 15% of that overall revenue is, is profit right at the top. It's going to vary from company to company, but I think it's a reasonable starting point for us to think about. If you were to take a company that looks like that and you were to say, let's see what happens in terms of our profit if we were to increase various levers by, by just by just one one percent, we just improve them by one single percentage point. If you improve fixed cost by by that, you get a basically a one percent increase in in profit. If you increase sales volume, you get about a two percent increase in, in in EBITDA. If you improve your cogs, you get about a four and a half percent. So that's a little bit better. But price knocks them all out of the water here. Price gives you a six point six percent increase in your in your EBITDA just from that one percent increase within within price. And I would say the lower your profit margin, the bigger that impact is going is going to be. This this relationship and this and this ordering is going to be the same whatever your your, your PL looks look, looks like. But the increase the price will be more dramatic the lower that your your profit margin is. Mm. So a small change in price makes a massive difference. Cool. We have a, one question for the slides before. Um, what, what does maintenance cover? That was a good question. I Sorry for interrupting you because I thought that was really irrelevant from lame threat. So do you want to take that one, Nancy? Yep. Yeah. In the context of that uh, survey data, that would have included primarily the hosting um, and you know minor updates, but not anything like additional services like SEO. So yeah. My final point on here as well is I think people often um, misread the relationship between price and volume, right? We often sort of think, well, let's drop prices a little bit in the hope that we get a bit more traction, we build a bit more, a bit more volume. But you look on the on, on the right hand here, you say generally for a business that looks like like this, if you were to decrease price by five percent, you would have to increase volume by almost twenty percent to keep your EBITDA the same, or likewise. If you increased your price by by five percent, you could actually decrease your volume by thirteen and a half percent and still keep the same the same EBITDA. So it's not to say don't care about those other those other levers, but price is incredibly important, and honestly, it's often the one that gets that gets compromised. So it makes a big a big difference if you actually focus on it. Now, I think as Santi did a great job teeing up right at the beginning of this. Right, you don't. It's, it's not just about price level. We do tend to go straight there for obvious, obvious reasons. We all think about pricing as price and price level, but there's a lot that goes into pricing. It really starts off with how you set yourself up and what you're trying to achieve and your value proposition and so forth. It goes into the structural components. So thinking about how you give options and how you scale price, then it gets into the price levels that you actually set. And then it goes beyond that, right? And thinks about given that we have these price levels, do we actually go out and get them? when we go into the market or do we just discount them all, all the way? So how do we think about, about all those areas? We are not going to have time to go through absolutely everything today within this short, short session. So we're just going to focus on a few areas. All of these yellow cells in here are things that we're going to touch upon as we go through this. So we're going to try and give you some, some good lessons to follow across, uh, across some of those most important areas. All right, unless there are any questions to go straight into, I'll go straight into, uh, into the first topic. That would be fantastic. All right. Let's talk about bundling first. So bundling, this is a term that we haven't we haven't really used up until now. We'll say firstly that there's another word that we closely associate this. It's packaging, right? And bundling and packaging for all intents and purposes are pretty pretty um, synonymous, I would say. I think packaging is generally done from a perspective of we've got all these things that we could offer. Let's break them down into smaller packages that we can sell. Whereas bundling is now saying we've got all these different things that we can sell. Let's bundle them together into in, in, into groups and sell them at this 
as, as this bundle. So for your context, agencies watching this, right, you'd really be thinking about selling groups of your, of your services. So things like copywriting, content pop, um, population, SEO, social media, et cetera, bundling all of those into a package or a group of different packages, which you can then sell. Uh, and often, not always, but usually when you're doing that, you're not, you're not itemizing the cost of each thing that goes into those, 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 those packagings. Rather than saying, like, we charged this many hours of this rate person doing this and all of this stuff, you're just saying to build a website, it is going to cost you, well, to build and manage a website, it's going to cost you, say, $1,000 on, on, on an annual basis. It's moving, it's moving to that. So that's really what we mean. Uh, and obviously it's a big departure from this typical services model where so many services even today are still done on this kind of hourly billing basis, right? We, we set rates per hour and we just, uh, we just tell people how many hours we use and we charge based on, based on that. So why would you go and do this? Why would you bundle services together into these, these larger bundles or larger packages? Well, there's a lot of benefits that you would get from it. Firstly, it's easier to sell, right? It's a lot easier to sell two or three different bundles than it is to sell loads of different services separately, which you then have to sort of, um, which you then have to itemize and roll up, roll up together. The selling process becomes easier. And it means then that you can create bundles that are aligned to customers' needs and say, so if you're looking for this, this is the bundle that works, that works for you. That's a lot simpler than having a customer going through a process of picking what they need in order to, to satisfy their needs from this very granular list of options. It gives you premium positioning, right? As soon as you move to a bundle, if you're positioning that bundle as being for a certain type of customer or to answer a certain need or to deliver a certain level of, of, of service, you're now moving away from just a, a provider of a laundry list of services into a solution provider, right? I have a solution for this, which generally, we'll talk a little bit about this later, it enables you enables the customer to think of you on a higher level. You're more likely to be able to charge higher prices when you do that because they're going to think of attaching more value to you, giving them this this bundle of things which which satisfies their their needs. There's decreased price sensitivity, right? When you when you're selling a bundle which has got all kinds of different services there, and it's not completely obvious exactly how many hours or how many um, how many different components are going into it. It's very difficult for the customer to think, well, you're charging too much for that and too much for this, and this one needs to be reduced by by 20%. And I saw a competitor of yours who was doing that rate for 15% lower. They can't do that so easier. It makes it much more difficult to, to directly compare and to and to beat you up on, on, on price. And I think to illustrate the value of that, you know, I have a I have a lawyer, <laughs> a lot of uh, small business owners do. Uh, he'll frequently send send bills. And it will say it's a certain amount of thousand dollars per month, and I think that sounds about right. No, no, no problem. Now, on the occasion when I go and actually look what he's building for, then you start getting to hold on a second. Was that really twenty five minutes over over there? And like, why am I paying this much for this person? You start to start challenging all of those things, whereas you actually didn't have an objection to the overall overall price level. So giving that level of granularity doesn't help you. Giving that uh, giving a bundled level makes you less likely to to disagree with that with, with that price. And lastly, price differentiation. If you have bundles, that means that you're probably able to produce different types of bundles that are maybe different levels of value and have different price points, which means that you're able to give different priced offerings to different customers who have different willingness to pay. That's a concept called price differentiation, which is incredibly important within, within pricing. And really that's how you capture value out of your, out of your market by being able to charge prices at the willingness to pay of, of, of the customers rather than just having one flat price that you offer to, to, to everyone. Now, price differentiation, as I said, is most frequently done through a particular type of bundling or packaging called tiering, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. There's lots of, there's lots of different ways to package, but by far the most common uh, is, is, is good, better, best. As I'm sure you, so if you ever go on any website of pretty much any company who's selling in a, in a subscription way, they usually have a, a small package, which is a low price with, uh, with a, a subset of, of services or, or, or features, a middle one that has a bit more, and then the premium one that has everything, right? It doesn't have to be three, and it isn't always free, but it, it often is because that's a nice, easy number to, uh, to, 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 to get to. But if you can do that, it, it's 
great because it gives you cust your, your customers a choice. You know, it makes them think about where do I want, want to be? Do I really want to focus on just getting something and therefore I'm willing to take a lot of the valuable components out and just get that good? Am I really looking for something that premium and has absolutely everything and therefore I need, I need the best? Or do I feel I'm somewhere in the middle and I just want to choose the, the better? And you shouldn't plan it this way, but practically a lot of the time customers do end up in, in, in the middle because they feel like, you know, I don't want anything at either end of the, 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 the spectrum. This is actually a system of buying that is easier for a customer than just giving them one option, take it or leave it, believe it or not. It sounds um, counterintuitive, in, in, but when you've only got one option, take it or leave it, it's hard to weigh up whether that's a good deal or a bad deal or whether it's what you want or it isn't because you haven't got anything to compare it to. When you have a series of options, simple options, it allows you to weigh that up. Uh, and actually there have been behavioral economic studies done that show that when you do give customers this kind of a level of choice, they are more likely to make a buying decision in the moment than they will be if you just give them one, one option. So definitely something that's worth doing. Very clear the benefits of it. And, but you know, obviously it's uh, one of those situations where the concept of doing it is easier than the process of doing it. So let's talk about a few guidelines for what you should do if you wanted to go ahead and build bundles or build these, these different tiers that you might want to offer. James, can I ask something just before we dive deep into the topic? Um, so Jared Broussard is asking, why are agencies charging such low site build charges? Remember the slide you showed before when we talked about average lifetime value and uh, yeah, that's just building a site. Why is that so low? Oh, I think you're on mute, Santi. I think Santi wanted to get that on. Yeah, I can Santi. answer that question. Thank Sorry. you. Um, so a lot of our agencies that we work with uh, actually use site building as a lead generation tool so then they can upsell um, to the more you know premium or advanced products like seo like pay-per-click um, and content so that that's some of the context for that another common use case i've seen is i've actually seen a lot of our customers come in as you know primarily advertising agencies they're running ppc they're running digital campaigns and they realize that they can bundle websites with that existing product um, as a way to improve campaign performance, um, increase stickiness, uh, things like that. So that's part of the context for that is that they're, you know, they're not just building um, just a website, they're using it uh, as a way to upsell and, and expand uh, with additional products. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Santi. Yeah, let's go back to building the tiers of services. All good. Yeah, so I think two ways of thinking about this, you can take the top down approach and the bottom up approach. And actually, I would suggest that you take both uh, and meet in the middle from both of these. That's usually the best way to go around this. But the top-down approach means you think about your customers. So if you think about all the different customers that you were that you were serving, try to think about how you would put them into groups based on on willingness to pay. You probably have some very price sensitive customers. You probably have some customers who are far less uh, price price sensitive. So think about those those different groups. It might be two, three, four, whatever the number of groups that you need to think about those those different systems. And then think about how the needs of those different um, segments um, vary in terms of your products, right? So just in terms of whether it's, um, you know, do they need only specific services within you what, what within what you offer, or do they need a, a broader a broader set? How deep do they need to go? Some some customer segments you find need a, a higher level of robustness or quality or, or time than than other segments too. So if you can start to think about how those needs vary, you can start thinking about Generally, if I was kind of build an offering for each one of those, how would I want to position that offering in order to meet those, those needs? And therefore, what do I need to include within all the services, uh, features that I, that, that, that I offer that could help do that? So that's a great way to start thinking about what should I be shooting for? What should my overall structure be, be, be looking for? And what would my value proposition for each of those uh, services be? And then you come at it the other way as well, put these two things together. And this is really going to, if you think about all the services that you would that you would offer and all the different levels of services as well, sometimes you go you know, deeper or more premium in certain areas, try to categorize them as what is core, right? What is, wh which of these services are things that almost all your customers are going to need a standard, you know, whenever they, whenever they come to you. What are the things that are gonna be premium? And these would be services which a lot of customers will value it and also be willing to pay extra to get it, right? So this would be something that if you did have a, a higher price tier for this, you know that there'd be a good portion, think like, you know, a third or up 
of your customers who might be interested in paying extra in order to get that because it is so valuable. And then also think about uh, your niche products as well. So these would be services that maybe a lot of customers actually can live without. Either they don't find them valuable or they just think it's more than they would than they would need. But there is a small subset of customers who do really value these things and would actually be willing to pay quite a lot in order in order to get it. You can categorize your services in those in those terms. It makes it very much easier to start building these these configurations uh, of tiers. Your base tier, like the entry tier, is going to be composed almost entirely of core services, right? These are just just the bare minimum that everybody needs. You might toss a premium feature in there just to make it special and in individually yours, but it would generally be be core. Your middle tier then starts to bring in more of those those premium tiers. And then your top tier, that's when you can start putting in those niche, uh, those niche things that are only valuable to a certain portion of, of, of customers. And actually, if there are things that are truly niche, and actually you think a lot of even your, your highest willingness to pay customers wouldn't want it, you could actually think about doing this an add-on, which is separate to your, um, to your tiering as well. But looking at it in those two different ways together and combining and meeting in, in, in the middle, really good way to get into options that make, that make sense and will ultimately drive your selling uh, process and help you price differentiate across your customer base as well. Okay, you know, that is all we were going to cover on bundling. So happy to take any questions on bundling if there are any, or we can uh, we can skip on to price levels. Yeah, no, there's some questions. Um, I hope they fit in here, but I would like to um, ask them to either send her you, James. Um, so Samir um, is asking, what about customers who insist on not paying upfront but promise more business? So kind of you can use me as a referral type of approach. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's a difficult one, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. you you can do that contractually, honestly, and I I have done that before. I right? look, I you know, I'm a professional services provider as well. And sometimes we we have uh, customers who say, look, we're going to give you a certain amount of volume or we're going to refer other other people to you. And I'm going, you know, make them put their money where their, where their mouth is. Say, look, uh, I'm going to give you this discount on the basis that you were going to do this. If you have not done this within X, X time frame, then I'm going to charge you for the extra bit that I that I discounted you, you know, so making it very clear what that is. Mm. Yeah. You know, and if, if the person's really intending to do that, then it shouldn't be an issue, right? They'll just mm -hmm. be holding them to, to to tasks with the contract. Yeah, totally. I think I think that's a good point to give it a kind of a deadline for it, and then they also have to deliver that promise, right? And so another follow up question from Samir again: um, What about customers who want to migrate from existing plans to tiered services? Yeah, this is, I mean, honestly, the field of subscription migration is a whole other uh, area to, to explore, honestly. Um, I would say usually when you're migrating customers over, you know, you want to get them over to a subscription plan where they have to start uh, paying, paying something more. You kind of need to use a combination of the carrot and, and the stick, honestly. And so the carrot being... I'm giving, you've got to give them something extra, right? If you're just, if you're giving them the same as you were giving them in, in, in the maintenance plan within the within the subscription, but they've got to pay three times more, they're obviously not going to do that. You need to give them something something else in order to do that. So it can be like, it could be an increased level of service. It could be, you know, more hours. It could be something special for them. You've got to think about what the hook is for them to make them want, want to do this. Mm. And then you use that with the stick at the same time. You can also say within your business that you are you are no longer supporting a certain way of charging, right? Like the 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 upfront plus plus maintenance, we are just not going to do this anymore. Give them notice, but say we are just not going to do this past this point. So you can either move over or you know we you can um, you can you can leave. Mm -hmm. You can also do things where you make the subscription plus sorry the uh, the the upfront but let plus maintenance model less valuable as well or like the price to value relationship lower you can say look we're moving off this therefore we have to increase our our maintenance fees and also you know we're not going to support this as actively as we will our subscription cu customers so the value of that goes down and the subscription value is much is much higher hmm. um, yeah so those are things to think about i won't suggest it's as simple as just doing that you have to really think about the implications and design the specific things exactly but that's the general theory of how you you move customers over mm. 
That's a great one. I have a couple more questions, if that's okay, um, because I think it's a super important topic that we talk about um, these strategies. So, um, Headsprung is asking, what are your thoughts on offering individual add-on packages? Yeah, uh, I think it's it's often um, it's often a really good thing to do. I would say a few. Well, as I say, I think the the situations where you would want an add-on would be if you do have something which is truly niche, right? It's something which most of your customers will not want. Uh, you know, it's really un only a few. And if you were to put it in that tiering system, it would mean that if somebody's buying a package where it's included, there's a good chance that they're going to be upset that they're implicitly paying more because this thing is included. Did you get to that situation? You really do not want that that service being in that in that tier. You want to pull it out and put it into into an add-on. And in that case, um, if you were to put that that niche um, service into a tier, you'd probably end up lowering the price of, of, of the tier to make it less you know less ob objectionable to those to those customers so in those in those situations you're usually better off actually putting it as, as an add-on and charging more for it and just having those people who want it buy it uh, so i think it's a very good thing to do in those situations the only thing to consider is you don't want to get to a point when you have so many add-ons that it starts to complexify the the pricing decision you know so if you have you know if you have a good better best system and a couple of add-ons it's probably going to be fine for most customers especially if those add-ons aren't things that you're necessarily going to lead with you're just going to bring up later but if you get to the point when you've got a set of 20 different add-ons for them to go through it starts to feel very granular it's kind of difficult to go to go through that and it's probably going to affect your sales process to, to navigate that every single time that's a great one. Um, two more questions, and then we can move on if that's okay for you. Um, so Jeff Perkins is asking, how should you segment customers by size, by numbers of pages, by how competitive their market is, and so on? Yeah, that's a great. I mean, so there's no. I think it's okay for me. I don't believe there is a right or wrong answer to this one, right? You've got to really think about uh, about what your different customer segments look like and therefore what is the metric that aligns to to those differences most if you you find that there is um if you find that your highest willingness to pay customers are generally bigger than your lowest willingness to pay customers which honestly most you know a lot of the time it is it's perfectly fine to 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 use that as a as a price metric if you find that in general your higher willingness to pay customers want more pages that's probably fine too uh, we haven't got into price metrics in detail today, but there's a whole set of criteria that you need to think about when you're picking a price metric, which is firstly, how aligned to the value it is, how acceptable it's going to be to customers. Sometimes customers are more happy paying based on some metrics than others, whether it grows or not. Ideally, you love a metric, right, that grows so you can increase your customer's revenue over time. There's a set of six that you should be you should be thinking about. and. Uh, happy to make some materials available after this session for anybody who wants to read more on, on price. Mm, mm. I think that would, be, that would be fantastic. And the last question before we move on, I think that is a really relevant one. Um, how do you, from Jim Lee, do you recommend publishing bundled price plans online? Yeah, I'm going to give a really good classic consultingly, it depends answer to <laughs> this one. <laughs> but um, yeah. it, re it really does. It's, I mean, it's, a lot of pricing decisions, we tend to think that there's a right way and a wrong way to price in different markets, right? But the reality is there often isn't. It's really more about uh, your objectives and what you're trying to achieve. And if you publish your prices online, the benefit of doing that is that it helps customers far easier sort of decide whether or not um, decide whether whether or not your prices are reasonable for them and therefore whether they want to reach out and get in and get in contact with you. So ultimately like it makes it, it's going to improve your sales velocity, right? You're going to get probably more, more conversations and the conversations you do have, you've already kind of figured out the willingness to pay is there. So it makes it, it makes it easier. The downside of publishing your prices online is that one, it makes it easier for your competitors to see what your prices are and for them to price against you, right? To price cheaper. If that is a thing that you are struggling with, that could be a problem. And also if your strategy, if your objectives are less about increasing sales volume and more about increasing your revenues or your, your profits, 
you're actually disincentivized from putting your prices up, up there because really you'd like to speak to a customer, try to figure out what their willingness to pay is, and then price at a level which is their willingness to pay. If you just priced your, your, your packages out there, chances are you may have completely underestimated how much they'd be willing to pay and you end up monetizing, under monetizing that, that, that deal. So yeah, so it's, it's really all comes down to what you're trying to achieve and then making that decision based on, on those objectives. Thank you very much. So I think this is all that is at the moment in the chat and we can move on. That's fine with you. Let's plow forward then. Okay, good. So setting the right price levels. So firstly, I'm sure that there's a concept uh, that most of the people on this, uh, on, on this session have heard of called willingness to pay, which is a really important principle within, within pricing very simple it means exactly what it sounds like it's how much a customer is willing to pay for a for a particular service however i would suggest to all of you that uh service companies usually don't end up thinking about willingness to pay too much when they set their prices they really tend to start with costs because service businesses have really high costs and they say look i need to make sure that my costs are covered therefore i'm going to start with costs and I'm going to put something on, on, on top of it, and that's how much I'll charge. And then I'll know that I'm always going to be covered from a, from a margin perspective. And look, there's, that's, it, it's not an unreasonable place to start from, right? I will say, let's make no mistake about it. If you're a service business and you are setting your prices, you do need to really understand your costs, and that will impact what you set your price as. However, it should not be the only thing that you consider when you set your, your, your prices. Customers to a large extent, don't care what your costs are. What customers care about is how much value you are providing them and what they'd be willing to pay for that for that value. So if you're setting your price based on, on cost, you're kind of ignoring the, the primary uh, data point, really, that is going to give you the right prices for, 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 for customers, and you're going to end up under monetizing your product. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But just know that going forward, if you're going to set prices well, you need to set price based on an understanding of costs and your willingness to pay as well. You really need to think about both of those, those levers. And let's illustrate why that is, right? So when you think about, think about you as a vendor, right? Let's say that you're building a site uh, for a customer and it costs you $1,000 to, to build that site in terms of the resources or all your own um, things that you are using to build that, to build that site. And you wanna maintain a 33% margin so you decide, I'm going to mark up my costs by 50%, set price at $1,500 for the site. There you go. I'm covered. I've got my 33% got my margin all set, which is true. If you sell at that price, you will end up there. But consider these two different customers that you may end up serving. Let's say you have customer A here who has a willingness to pay for that site of $1,800. This customer will buy it. And you'll make $500 profit, and the difference between your cost of $1,000 and your price of $1,500 there. But you've missed out on a bunch of extra profit that you could have got from this customer had you priced to, to its, its willingness to pay. So you've left $300 on, on, on the table. So technically, you've under-monetized this, this, this customer. Likewise, consider customer B here. So customer B has a willingness to pay of $1,200. Now, at your $1,500 price, you're this customer is not going to buy from you. They're not going to be a customer. Now, they didn't clear your, your, uh, your, your profit target, but if you had sold to them for their willingness to pay of $1,200, you would have made $200 profit. So really, if your objective is just to maximize profit, that would still be a, a good deal to have, and you've lost that. So just looking at these two deals, really, if you were doing a cost-plus approach, you would have made $500 worth of profit, and if you'd done more of a willingness to pay based approach, you would have made $1,000 of profit. So I know this is a very simplified example, but please trust me, it plays out in, in the real life. If you are, if you're just taking this kind of flat cost plus approach, you are always going to under monetize your, 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 your market. You're going to get less than you should do from customers who would pay more. And you're going to miss out on business that you could have otherwise gotten profitably because you were being too rigid with your, with your prices there. That said, cost is still important to consider, right? There's one customer C, say, that is not shown on here. Let's say their willingness to pay was $800. If you were only focused on willingness to pay, then you'd sell to them for $800.
but that's of course that's under your cost so you'd be getting a negative margin in that place so in that case you're better off not selling to that to that customer so you've got to think about both of them uh, but willingness to pay i think is the one that we don't think about so it's the one that we really need to to turn our attention to So willingness to pay, it's a it's a fuzzy concept, right? It's difficult to it's difficult to get to willingness to pay. It's very difficult to just look at a customer and know what their willingness to pay is. We have to work it out. Uh, and I would say what makes it even more complexifying is that customer willingness to pay doesn't stay the same over time. It can change. Uh, and also your customer's willingness to pay for the same thing might be different. You know, you think about even something as simple as a cup of coffee, you probably got some customers who'd be only willing to pay like a dollar fifty for it and others who'd be willing to pay close to ten dollars. So it's tough. Uh, and it's because it's dependent on a lot of different factors that we need to understand if we really want to try to get to willingness to pay. And the first one, perhaps the most obvious, is perceived value. If customers see more value in your product, they will pay more for it. Um, and some of that just comes from what the actual value of the product is, what the quality is, what the robustness is, if there's some kind of quantity of something you're giving, how much is it? Is it there? But note that I picked the word perceived and not actual. Actual value informs perceived value, but sometimes customers don't see all the value that's there because we didn't communicate it. We didn't tell them uh, it was there in, in the right way. We didn't quantify it. We didn't position ourselves to sort of to show that we have that kind of value. So you can have a lot of value in reality, but it may not get seen by the, by, by the customer and therefore they may not be willing to pay for it. There's also alternatives as well, right? Let's say if you were the only uh, web agency in town, you might be able to sell your, your sites for $10,000 uh, a go every single time without any issues. But then if another competitor comes in and starts selling sites for $2,000, even if they're nowhere near the quality of yours, just the fact that they're there and the fact that there's now an alternative price point there is going to affect what is seen as the reasonable price to value relationship within the market. So it's, you know, it, your, your competitors and what they are charging for what they do is going to influence what customers will pay for your, for your product. And, you know, this is why price wars are so destructive because if one competitor drops their prices in order to win business, then the other, if, if the other competitors don't do anything, they just leave their prices the same, then all the business is going to go to this other, this other competitor. So they all drop their prices too. And all that you've done is kept the volumes the same, but just made sure that every vendor within, within the space has got lower price for the amount of value that they are, that, that, that they're giving. So really important, you know, you've really got to consider these, these dynamics and you do need to look at what other competitors are charging for their services. You just need to think about the value that they're providing as well so that you don't end up just trying to match them. Expectations make a role as well. I think we tend to think that in the B2B space, everybody's very logical and sort of robotic, but the reality is, you know, they're probably a bit more logical than consumers are, but there's still a lot of emotions that comes into buying to buying decisions. And frankly, if your customers, for whatever reason, don't think that your pricing is fair, you know, they, they won't necessarily pay for it. Um, I wrote an article recently about... Um, company called Canva, which I'm sure many of you guys have, have used. It's a graphic design package. And they've just raised their prices for one of their packages by 300%. Because they were always this like very budget um, budget uh, package, right? So they were always really, really low price. Now, if you look at it objectively, actually, the prices that they raised to are still way lower than all of the all of their competitors are. And they also, they're not forcing customers into this package. There are still other offerings that they that they have. And yet, the reaction from the customer base is, this is terrible. I can't believe they do this. I'm running off to Adobe, who, by the way, are charging like 12 times the amount that Canva are charging. So it's like, it's not logical. It's an emotional thing. But, you know, if, if, if customers have expectations that something should cost a certain amount, that is a powerful and important input. The last thing is budget as well. I mean, we tend to, well, let's say we tend to, there are people, there is a school of thought out there. There are people who will tell you that, you know, budget doesn't really matter when it comes to pricing. If the value is there, then customers will pay it. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that's not the case right? because you can see value in something. You know, I'm sure a lot of people see value in a Ferrari, but it doesn't mean that they're going to sacrifice all the other things that they need to spend their money on in order to buy a Ferrari. There are some things which are, you know, just more important for them to spend the funds that they have uh, that are available on, and therefore they wouldn't make that 
investment. And so it is when we're buying things for the for the business. There are some things that we might want want to do. We might believe that a you know a new website is worth ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. But if I just don't physically have access to that amount, then I can't spend. I can't spend it. Um, and this is why you end up with different prices, I think, for larger companies than smaller companies, because larger companies just have higher budgets and they're they're more willing to they're more willing to spend on something that provides the same amount of value. So all of these things all kind of come together, they pull in different directions, and it makes it very difficult for us to get to, to willing to pay. There, there are ways that we can actually um, we can actually calculate it. Primary research is the usual way of getting to this. I mean, not everybody has budget to go and do a huge do a huge survey, but I would say, have you guys asked your customers what their willingness to pay is? I mean, just using simple Van Westendorp style methodology of saying, hey, look, if you were buying a new website today, what do you think would be a, a, a bargain price, right? What would be an expensive price, but you'd still be con considering buying it? What would be a price that you'd, you know, you'd no longer consider it? It's just too much at this at this point. Not all your customers are going to be willing to answer those those questions, and some customers are going to game it and try to low, low ball you. But a lot of them, especially your more loyal ones, will probably answer pretty honestly. And just through doing a few interviews like that, you can try to get a gauge of what the rough pricing range uh, would be where you might be able to, to end up. If you're not able to go out and do willingness to pay research, you probably still want to try to figure out whether you might be underpricing. Um, and there are a few things that you can, a you, few signs that will suggest that you are underpricing here. One, customers are never complaining about, about your price. If you never get any pushback on your price levels from customers or them trying to get a discount from it, you're almost certainly massively underpricing your products. A lot of the time, customers will try to get a discount on something just because they can, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So if they're not doing that, it's probably too low for them to even sort of quibble about it. And therefore, you've probably got some some headroom. It's just a question of how much. If customers talk about the fact that you are great value for money, right? That would suggest that you are underpricing your product. You are delivering too much value for the amount that you are that you are charging. Uh, and that's a great situation to be in, right? Because if customers are willing to say that, they're probably also willing to write you testimonials that say how great your work is, and that will help you command higher prices in, in, in subsequent deals. But if you're getting that all the time, you probably should be pricing higher. If you feel that you provide a superior offering versus your competitors, but you're matching their pricing, this is a situation I see so many companies in, right? They feel like we're better than everybody else, but we price at the same level as our as our competitors. If you're truly um, providing a higher level of quality, then from buyers who value that quality, you will be able to get a higher price. Not from everybody. If you if you if you um, talk to what we call price buyers who are really only interested in just getting the best deal, you're never going to win at a higher price for those people. But that's probably not the customer that most of the time you want. You probably want those customers who are going to value the differentiation in, in, in the work. And in that case, you want to be charging higher prices to reflect the value-added quality uh, that you that you provide. I'd also say that you know it's very difficult to judge a vendor from the outside before you start working with them. And price is a signal for quality. And if there's two companies that are priced the same, you're going to assume that they are about the same the same quality. If there's one one vendor that is priced significantly higher, unless there's other things that out there that scream their um, incorrectly priced, you're probably going to assume that the more expensive one is better. If your win rate is very high, if you are never losing a deal on, on price, you're almost certainly pricing too, too low. And that either means that your initial pricing is too low or you're discounting too much in order to win, to win deals. If you, if the last time you increased your prices, you didn't lose any sales volume, or if you did it with your current current customers, didn't get any churn. Again, there's no negative reaction to a price there, and it suggests that you're probably way under under pricing. Because if you were a bit more competitively priced, you'd probably expect a couple of customers at least to to have a have a gripe. The last one here, it's similar to um, to the, the the offering piece of it. If larger companies or kind of the more premium customers that you are trying to get to never consider you as a viable option, it may well be because you're underpricing. Say these larger companies um, and more premium buyers often do um, 
often do just use price as a as a sign of of quality, and they assume that if you're not pricing at least at a certain level, you can't be any you can't be any good, and so you might not even be in the in the consideration set for that. Uh, and I've seen that I've seen people uh, within websites convey to an agency that they really want like a really great website and they wanted to do this that and the other and they had like a certain price in their head which obviously they didn't share but they, they had a certain price of what it's going to cost and the agency has come in in like you know a third of the price that they were that they were thinking of and their reaction is well you know they clearly don't get what we're looking for we're not going to get the quality that we're looking for if we went for them and therefore we won't even go in that in that direction for all we know they may have done a wonderful job but they never would have got the opportunity because they weren't priced hard enough there is definitely such a thing as too cheap so what are some things that you can do to try to win at higher prices well there's probably a lot of things that we could talk about here i'll give you three things to grab onto firstly focusing on value right so that obviously means a in terms of the actual uh offering that you have try to be as valuable as possible try to be different, try to be differentiated versus your versus your, your your competitors. But it also means focusing on that perception side as well, making sure that it comes across, doing the things within your communication that show that you are higher value, right? So including examples of your work, if it is truly, truly better, making sure that your materials of your proposals and everything sort of position yourselves as a really professional, slick organization, right? There's a reason why consulting firms spend so much time on the making their proposals look beautiful is because it's a signal of quality, right? Like it doesn't really count for anything. It's just formatting within a deck, but it just looks like they are, um, uh, like they're really, really professional. The amount of customization that you show, right? Just really focusing on, on the customer and really meeting their needs and talking about, um, the specifics that you've done different for them because they're a specific snowflake just positions you at like a higher level offering than it would do if you were just doing something which clearly looks like it's the same, you know, set of free options that you provide to everyone. So all of those positioning things, uh, you know, and showing the value that you have can make a difference. Secondly, muddying the waters, right? Like the easier you make it to compare your prices to your, to your competition, the easier it is for you to be beaten up on, on price. So if you're able to, set your price in a slightly different way, have slightly different packages, make it so that it's much more difficult to say, you guys are doing exactly the same thing and you are higher. That will help you defend your, your, your price point when it comes to negotiations. And lastly, being willing to lose on price. As I say, if you wanna charge higher prices and you want to sell more to customers who have a higher willingness to pay, you have to be willing to lose some deals on, on price. You have to accept that there are gonna be some customers who are only interested in the lowest price that they can they can get and they are not going to buy from you most most likely if you take the mentality of like we're never going to lose a deal on price practically it is going to be very difficult for you to raise your prices on on average because you're always going to start moving down at the slightest sign of, of, of resistance all right this was all i wanted to talk about on price levels uh you know we got some stuff on discounting at the, at the end but happy to take some Questions on price levels, are there any? Um, I think we're fine with the price leveling um, because um, Buddha already answered some questions while you were presenting. So I think we're fine to go into discounting and then we can take on more questions. Sounds good. Okay. So preventing discounting. Let's talk about this. So I think the first point here is to, uh, is to make the point that not all discounting is bad. I think in the pricing world, the word discounting is almost a dirty word. <laughs> it's like something that we all feel that we shouldn't be doing. It's terrible. Discounting is the source of all evil. We're leaking value through discounting. And sometimes that's true, but not all the time. And I think it's it's really important to put it in context and think about when it's good, or when it's okay, and when it's not okay. And I will maintain that discounting itself is not the enemy. I'd actually think that discounting is a really useful tool within sales, right? So firstly, it can help within within price uh, price differentiation. For example, you might say that, you know, for a set of customers, I'm willing to price, like I love to price my sites at making it up $6,000 but I might be willing to go down to $4,000 in certain circumstances if the customer just hasn't got a high enough willingness to pay. 
but you might not have a price structure that allows you to price differentiate based on that, right? It may not be clear like which customer is going to end up in which in which place. It's not some kind of identifiable thing that you can see from from, from the outside. Therefore, you can't say your value on metric X is this. Therefore, this is your price level. You might be able to, you might not. If you can't do it, then being able to discount, starting at a high price and then just discounting in order to get to that to that lower willingness to pay customer is a really helpful way of doing it. But you know, you're doing it in a structured, thoughtful way, not just discounting in order to win to win the deal. And that's that, that's key. It also helps uh, in situations which I see all the time when I often see customers have an attitude, which means they're like, I'm waiting for this quote from my from my vendor. I don't know what they're gonna charge me, but I do know that whatever it is, I'm gonna immediately ask for 20% off. Right? And it's not because they're thinking about a particular price point in their head. They just want to deal. Whatever the price they feel like they, the, the, the vendor is charging them, they feel they should pay something less than that. And if you, if you, if you don't discount, then you know, maybe you'll be able to get the customer over the line, but you know, maybe they won't. Maybe they just, it's really important to them to get that, to feel that they have that, have that discount. And if you don't give it to them and somebody else does, they might move ahead with that, with that other vendor. It's not about the price level it ends up at. It just it's just about you know what um, what discount they were they were seen to get. So ideally, I would suggest you should plan for discounting. You should plan for a certain amount of discounting that is gonna that is gonna happen. Um, and it means that instead of saying I'm gonna set my my prices at the level that I think I should be charging customers, and anything from there is value leakage. Set your prices based on the amount that you would like customers to end up paying and then back out a discount from it, right? So if I say that, like, I think the willingness to pay of customers is $150, but I know that all my, that I know that all my customers are going to ask for a 25% discount, then I would set my list price at $200. And then I know that with a 25% discount, I'm going to get down to $150. So at that point, if that happens, if I set my, my list price at, at $200, I end up selling at 150. I haven't lost any value because I knew that I was trying to get to 150 dollars, and that's absolutely fine. You built it in, then you're no longer leaking leaking value. However, discounting is destructive and is bad uh, when it's unnecessary, right? And this is really what people are talking about when they say that discounting is bad. It's like it's it's not the act of discounting in itself. It is discounting more than you need to do in order to win a deal. Uh, and that happens all the time uh, for you know quite clear reasons. And I think probably one of the biggest reasons that that happens, and this is a fact, uh, I have you know, lots of stuff we can use to back this up, won't get into it today, but salespeople will tend to discount as much as they are able to, right? And you know, say without getting into details, basically salespeople operate on the expected payout that they're going to get within any deal. A lot of the times we incentivize salespeople based on a certain flat commission off, off the revenue that they that they bring in. So if a salesperson raises their revenue their uh, their price level by by 10%, they get 10% more commission if they if they win. But most of the time, if they raise their price by by 10%, their perception of the chance of them winning that deal drops off a cliff. Right. So their sort of their expected payout at any price level is always going to be lowest. At the at the lowest price, sorry, they're always going to be highest at the lowest lowest price levels. So they're always going to be incentivized to discount as much as they're able to. And you can see this in patterns within within discounts, right? If you look at the frequency of discounting at different different percentages, you tend to see that you get massive peaks at the thresholds that like a sales rep is able to to, to discount to, and then at the the discount level that a manager can approve to, they just drop straight to the maximum levels that they can always offer. So it makes sense why it happens, um, and there are things that you can do to try to limit that, right? And there's three levers that we think about uh, within Monovate to prevent that. The first one is rules. So this is this is the stick, right? This is stopping sales reps being able to discount more than you would than you would want them to. Um, the most obvious form of this is setting those thresholds. As I say, give them a limit that they can they can set discount based on. But you can also get more get more strategic with this, right? And think about maybe there are situations that will command a certain amount of discount. Like if you sign up for a two year deal, you get a 4% discount. And then if you 
give me two testimonials, that's an extra 2%. So if you build that kind of quite rigid structure around that, then it's less of a case of like just giving them as much as they, they need and they have to pick the qualifying situations and add up the discount that they would they would get from it. That can be very helpful. Even better, but the same line of thinking is thinking about give gets, which are the same kind of idea, but it's, it's really more value trades than it is, um, than, than it is um, discounting straight off because you're saying what can you give me of value that will allow me to give you a slightly lower lower price point multi-year discounts are an example of that because you're getting a reduction in churn through them signing up for those for those extra years giving testimonials giving references uh introductions etc all these all these things that might actually give some value for you are a better reason to give a price discount than just discounting because the customer wants a discount so rules kind of swallows up all of those different areas. Then there's incentives, which is the idea that you give scales reps skin in the game to push for lower discounts or to push for higher prices. So this really means kind of giving them disproportionately higher incentives at higher, at higher price levels. Because as we've talked about, a little bit of price makes a massive difference to our, to our EBITDA. So a little bit of price difference makes a you know, would, would be worth a lot more to you, the com com company. So you might get to the point when you are setting incentives based on discount levels or setting prices, pre setting incentives based on margin rather than setting it based on, on, on revenues. Lots of very formal ways to do it. Also just tracking sales reps discounts and kind of, and publishing lists of who's discounted the most and stuff that can change behavior as well. But you really just got to give them a reason to want to price at a higher level. And then lastly, the one that gets forgotten about quite frequently is enablers. Uh, and this is really important because it, it addresses that thing that I talked about that sales reps tend to think that they have a much lower chance of winning when you increase the price slightly. If you can affect that, that's probably the best way of getting overall behavioral change. And there's many things you can do there. Part of that is based on, on knowledge. Like if you're able to go and do research and get data that shows that actually the willingness to pay is higher than perhaps the sales reps thought that it was, then obviously they're going to feel more able to win at those higher price levels. So they're probably going to feel better about pushing for them. Uh, and you can also think about their ability to have those, those conversations as well. So, you know, negotiation training and giving them the value messaging that they can use to reinforce value or, objection handling make them better able to navigate those those conversations based on, on on price all the things that you can do to make them feel that they are more able to win at those higher prices will make a big difference so lots we could go in today but as i say just wanted to to give you a, an overview of, of what to think about when you're building that thank you very much um before we close up the day actually and because we're at the end of our three sessions i have um one question that uh still relevant to ron rose um can you please cover the premium monthly upscale pricing seo content what would that be or do you have any take on that yeah so i think that question is asking if we had any data on what those premium services uh agencies are charging for and we don't have that data um i think that's a difficult question as we go back to kind of this idea of willingness to pay and um, that it's a very individual uh question there's no one size fits all for these premium services so um yeah long answer or short answer is we don't we don't have that data available mm -hmm. okay thank you very much thank you santi and thank you james i think um we covered it all and it was fantastic. Yeah, it depends as always, the favorite uh, sentence of SEOs. Um, great first day to start and tomorrow is a super exciting day, day two, do the con and we will talk about trends to watch. So don't miss this one because we have really legends of SEO that are joining this session. So 100% um, come join um comment and i love the interaction here today it was it was amazing uh, to connect um per chat and I, I really loved it and i will definitely be in the background tomorrow but i will listen to all the sessions so thank you very much um everyone who's involved in organizing this and yeah see you then all tomorrow <laughs>